Hi, everyone. My name is Anidio Dobong, and I'm part of the Google Developer Programs team in North America. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to Between the Brackets. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. We'd love to know you, know where you're joining from. And while you do that, I'd like to kick it off with an introduction to Between the Brackets. Between the Brackets is a monthly web series we, where we host experts talk about Google products and technologies. You can check out the website for more information on our schedule on the topics we've covered over the years and the topics we'll be covering specifically going forward. We're thrilled to have you join us today, and we hope you'll enjoy the show. Now, a little bit of housekeeping for today. A uh, great guideline for all of our events. I'd like to remind all of us, all of you, to be excellent to each other. To that extent, please follow all our community guidelines on our website and also on the links we share. This is a live event. You can feel free to add your questions to the chat and also be mindful of those questions as they should follow our community guidelines as well. We're here to help with your questions. Any concerns you have, you can feel free to share with our team directly via email, btb-team at google.com. All right, let's get started. Today's episode, we'll be having Stefan and Alan talking about advanced wearables for the enterprise. You can ask your questions during the show directly in the comment section, like I said before, and we will try to address them in a timely matter. Stefan is a product manager at Google, leading the Glass Enterprise product line. His work centers around augmented reality and mixed reality and enabling businesses via a head-mounted wearable solution. Alan is a Google developer expert for Google Assistant and all the technologies helping other developers understand how they can apply these skills they already have to this growing technology. He's a senior project engineer at Objective Consulting and a co-author of Designing and Developing for Google Glass. Welcome, Stefan and Alan. Thanks, it's great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I know I did a very brief introduction of Stefan. Do you wanna take it from there and do a self-introduction or any other thing you wanna highlight before I go off the screen? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, and thank you to everybody uh, who sees this live and sees it on recording. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am the product manager um, and I'm responsible for our Enterprise Glass product line. That includes uh, the hardware, uh, Enterprise Glass Edition 2, um, which is we have in the market today for businesses, as well as our software stack and platform that supports that. And we're going to talk a little bit about both of those today and how where we're going uh, and how that you can develop for it. Last thing is I am here in California. Uh, so it, hopefully, uh, you know, everything goes, goes smoothly. And <laughs> thanks, Yvonne, for the good vibes. And um, yeah, please feel free to ask any questions. I do want to set a little ground rules though. I'm not going to rehash Google Glass. I'm happy to say what we've learned about it. Uh, I think the world has uh, already uh, kind of from you know, the blog sphere to Googlers to others have all talked about that. But uh, we did learn a lot. And I'm happy to share what we learned and how we're going to address it and how we'll address it moving forward. Uh, so with that, uh, Alan, uh, hand it off to you to, you know, do some more introductions on yourself. Oh, thanks. Um, so as noted, I've been in the, the glass community for a long time. Uh, I was one of the original glass explorers. I was at the uh, original um, camps where we learned to develop for it. So, and I've, I've hopefully helped a lot of people learn how to develop for glass. So it was really exciting when I had the opportunity to, to be able to, to talk with you, Stefan, about um, where glass was gonna be going and what that was gonna look like for developers and how very different uh, I think it was from the past, but also echoing many of the same ideas that we talked about back then. Um, as you said, the, the lessons learned and where we take it going forward. So I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. Thanks, me too. So I guess kind of to kick it off, one of the, the big things that in some ways a little bit coincidental from uh, when we were planning this is you guys published a blog post last week talking about some updates to uh, Glass Enterprise V2. And they kind of hint at some, some future about where development is going. So you wanna talk about that blog post a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. So <clears throat> last week, uh, you can find it on the keynote blog uh, at uh, on google.com under ARVR. 
uh, we announced our early access program to what is going to be the future platform that we will uh, be looking at developing applications in. So what does that mean? Uh, we are we announced a new companion application that runs uh, on Android. It's on Pixel today. Uh, it uses the phone as your application environment and then wirelessly streams it up to the glass. Now, this is a pretty big change for us in a couple of ways. So the first way that it's a big change is that the Enterprise Edition 2 product, or I'm just going to call it GE2, moving on. That's, our, that's what we call it internally. So I'm just going to call it GE2. Uh, is um, is a standalone AOSP device. So you can write applications and they'll run on the, the GE2 itself. That's pretty limiting from a developer standpoint, as we see. It's also empowering if you just want something that's going to run on the device. But the limitation is a lot of us have apps that we've already written for, for the phone. And what we want to do is, is some, it's how very simply glass enable this, right? And that's what with this early access and this kind of sneak peek is on the direction that we're headed. Um, that wireless tether is using Wi-Fi direct, very high bandwidth, very stable, and it talks to the phone. And then the idea is to simply be able to use your application on the phone, few lines of code that would connect to what you want to display, how you want to pick up things like microphone or, uh, or use the speaker, uh, we have the limited capability for using a camera, so you can use it, but we're, that's a lesson learned. We're really being you know, thoughtful on the privacy moments in businesses. Um, and, uh, and then allow your, your app to be better together. And that's, that's what we think is the future. The future is the best little computer on, on the planet is that one in your pocket. And use the glass to allow people to keep their hands free and see some things in their line of sight. Um, and to show that off, we had three apps that we launched in this EAP. The first one is an integration with Google Tasks. So think of it as somebody walking around with a checklist and they can check that off without having to look at their phone or, or tablet or something. The other one is, uh, is an extension of what we showed at IO. So if you saw the language translation um, uh, prototype and demo that we had at IO, we've now brought that software to GE2. And uh, and this kind of split compute model, wirelessly tethered model, um, and that now supporting 15 languages in real time translation, as well as transcription, which we're really excited about because there are a lot of folks who, for various reasons, you know, are hard of hearing or would actually it would help because of loud environments um, that they have to wear ear protection, such as could they could we help them with just transcription of the same language to same language. So that's in preview uh, in, on, in this early access program. And then the last one is actually probably what we should have done a while ago, but it's easier now. It's uh, taking photos on the glass allows you to now go and uh, save that to the phone. And then it shows up in, in the media folder, which on a Pixel phone goes to Google Photos. And then you can manage and keep your photo secure there. So those are all examples of where we see development going over the next couple of years. This is a little preview of our future direction. And I've got to say, all three were really exciting to me as I saw them. Um, and two of them, the the one about the, the task interface was particularly exciting to me since that was literally the first application that I wrote was a to-do list that worked with Google Sheets. And I think kind of one of the big, um, the, the, the great things about it, one of the power behind it is it kind of says, you can have access to the same data no matter what platform you're on. So if you're doing it through your phone, you can edit your tasks on your phone. If you're at a, a desktop, you can edit your tasks there. And when you're looking at it uh, on the move, you can access it through glass. And I think that's kind of really the big power behind what head-mounted wearables are all about, is not providing you the same access to information, but providing you the best access to information that's head-mounted. You know, how, how, does, how do your apps need to look and work different when it's on your head versus in your pocket versus on the desktop? Um, and I think that's, that's a great challenge for developers, but I, I'm, great, I'm thrilled to see that this is now kind of uh, bringing it together. Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Is it doesn't make any sense to replicate data streams and it has to be a better together. And, and that's, you know, talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the enterprise, because I do want to share, 
Like these solutions are for businesses to use for their business, you know, to, for their employees and for, and for uh, you know, for them to get their job done. We really see GE2, it, it's a tool that's in the toolbox and the apps are tools to help the you know, employees and workers do their job. And that it does matter the different tools for different times and, th- and places and job. And when, where we see a lot of attraction uh, from companies that I would call out for developers to think about is that when you have a worker who needs to use their hands and, and that it goes across lots of industries, right? I mean, we've got doctors have to use their hands, right? We've got um, first responders use their hands. We have construction workers who have to keep their hands free. And those are all, you know, as well as many other maintenance, uh, real estate agents, like it goes across the gamut. It's, it's endless. So the solutions really become, how do I put, uh, oh, I was going to get a call. <laughs> I love that live stream. All right. Uh, so it really kind of does come into how do I help that person do their job better with my application? And TAS is an example of like from cloud all the way out to frontline. Um, how you can keep that data consistent, how you can speed up the velocity of that data. Um, and I'd say there's just so many other use cases, uh, you know, remote collaboration video calls. Like we, we have an app that's Google Meet today that runs on the glass. We'll be bringing that over to this, this environment uh, next year. And it's the idea of how do I allow these, you know, workers to feel connected and do things and interact. Um, and from a development standpoint, we really do look at how do I take some of the app that makes sense? I mean, like this is, is a pretty small you know, screen. It's not directly in your field of view um, for safety reasons. And, you know, what information is critical to get to that person? So um, I you know, just share that, you know, really think about it as uh, when you're developing is what, what is in that app on the phone? What's in that data, either on the phone or in the cloud? that would be beneficial for someone to, to use to get their job done. Could be training manuals, it could be uh, instructions, it could be safety announcements and warnings. Um, I'll share, we have a customer who just uses Glass to give safety you know, warnings. Like their employees have an app that if something happens in the facility they're working on, they're told how to exit the facility you know, quickly for safety, right? So. Sometimes the most basic things are really powerful when they're right up in, in someone's line of sight. Yeah, no, that's a, an excellent point. You know, one of the things that I remember learning from, again, the lessons learned from the old glass is being able to get those notifications right there and right present and act on them quickly and then get back to what's around you. Um, so I want to encourage folks to, to send in questions. We, will be ta- we do take your questions and we will, we will be getting to some of them. Um, while those are still coming in, I see we have one from from Emily now. Um, Emily works in healthcare, uh, needs to ensure that glass is charged. You wanna talk a little bit about the hardware and how it's charged and how good the battery is and and what the battery pack is and so forth. Yeah, totally. So first of all, Alan is sporting GE2 right now. uh, This is GE2. That that is it, that's what it looks like. For for Um, those who are used to seeing me in my my usual blue glass, I, I swapped it up today for this event. Uh, and I've been trying to wear this around a little bit more to get used to it. Cool. Um, so Emily, yeah, to your question, you can you can wire tether the device. So there's a USB C port in the in the back of the device, and it does charge. So you can have an application that's running on the device or on your phone, and uh, you can have it plugged in, which we have plenty of folks do, and they just connect it to their phone, you, as, and the phone will act as a battery. Um, while you use it, or you can connect it to an external battery pack. Um, I'll give a couple of just hardware specs uh, for folks. So the battery lasts roughly four to five hours of of normal use. Uh, Video calls, you know, running a Google Meet is a little less. It's a couple hours. Uh, But still, we spent a bunch of effort and time to optimize, you know, the processor and and the radios and everything in, in the device to get as much as we can out of that battery pack. Um, public spec, it's 800 milliamp battery pack, uh, and we have fast charge. So the good news is if you ever do end up in a low battery you know, state, you can plug it in uh, to any USB-C charger and you can charge it up. Uh, well, maybe not like a hundred watt charger. That'd probably be a little extreme, but uh, we try to keep around 1.5 amps of, of flow. 
uh, and it will fast charge all the way up to 80, 85% in 20 minutes. So there we go. Yeah, so I pulled up our specs. Cool. Yeah, I'll give a plug, google.com slash glass. Uh, and um, we fast charge. So if you do end up at a point where you're low, you can do it. Now, why is it four or five hours? Okay, so there's a couple of things to think about on the hardware side. You don't want something that is is more than about, you know, 80 to 100 grams total. We come in with a safety frame at 72 grams. What uh, Alan's wearing is a TI band that comes in at 56 grams uh, with the device. So people can wear it all day. Uh, we did a lot of user study when we designed this and people get neck pain and they get shoulder pain from having something heavy on. So we want to keep it light. And to do that, we couldn't put some big battery pack on it. So we had to optimize for weight and comfort first and foremost, so that people would actually use this tool to do their job, right? And be and want to do it. And then allow a charge capability in the fast charge so that when they're on a break or they're in between shifts, they just plug it in and it's fully charged ready for their second half of their work, work day. One of the things that I really appreciated about the original glass, and I, I feel it in this one even more so, is how much attention was done uh, around the weight and making sure not just that it's as light as possible, but also the, the weight balance is pretty equitable. So, you know, it's not all sitting on your nose. It's, it's kind of nicely distributed throughout. Um, that's always been a good thing. Yeah, I'm stoked that you noticed that because uh, the balance point is right in the front of your ear. So it balances, you can just put your finger on when you don't have a frame on it, it balances right there. And that was a lot of work. Uh, I have to give props out to the whole Glass Enterprise team, hardware and software. They spend a, a ridiculous amount of time and they still spend a ridiculous amount of time focused on user comfort and, and how to get those apps to be usable. It really does show the, the whole very, very thoughtful design process that has gone into it at, at every level. Um, you said something a few minutes ago, and I wanted to kind of follow up on it with a, a follow-up question. You talked about the use of glass as a hands-free device and it being very hands-free oriented. Um, a lot of folks, again, who know me know that I've moved uh, from, from glass to very uh, Google Assistant and voice-oriented stuff. What is the, um, I guess, the developer perspective on using voice with glass? How, how much voice control is allowed for and enabled there or, or how can developers tap into that? Yeah. So um, awesome question, man. Alan, you got <laughs> great ones today. Uh, so the um, voice command uh, we took out after Google Glass, uh, that capability, it is a very high priority without giving away too much. It's a very high priority for us in the near future to bring back voice commands and, and, you can build voice commands into your applications today. So there's two kind of spectrums for voice commands. There's commands for the system. So think like hot words and things like that. And then there's, can you do voice commands in your app? You can do voice commands in your app today. It's built into AOSP, we expose it. And that is, um, there's actually a demo up on our developer site on how to build that into your apps. And, um, and we highly recommend it in environments that are, probably below 60, 65 decibels of background noise. The reason is, and this is why we took it out, is uh, two things. Uh, one is funny, one is not. The not funny one is just when there's a lot of background noise, it's tough for the microphones to sound isolate, right? So you'll get false positives, you'll get people having um, you know, a bad experience. The funny one is we actually had complaints uh, of people who were voice bombing their coworkers. So they'd run by somebody wearing glass and they'd scream a command and then the glass would do its thing. So uh, speaker segmentation is a big focus for us on the microphones, doing some beam forming and some better sound isolation. We have three microphones on the device. So we have a uh, good capability to, to build that in. And that's a, an area of focus for us in development. And that's going to parlay over to developers being able to use hot words in the device and then having better voice uh, control in their apps. And that's, that is, uh, you know, to say, that's something we're very focused on. I would say everybody wants voice. Actually, I think there was a comment in there. I think Emily said, yeah, voice commands and storing notes and everything. Yeah, everybody wants voice back. Um, it would be easy just to say, you know, sure, we'll just open everything up like I do with the phone. Um, 
But we want to also be cognizant of the ecosystem. And the other thing is we want to be cognizant of privacy. So I'm actually going to pick up, Emily, on your question around voice notes. We want to make sure that the microphone is, is really well tuned and beam formed to the wearer. So when they make voice notes, they don't have to shout. They don't have to yell. You don't want bystanders to sit in there listening to, I don't know, a doctor saying notes or, uh, or a home inspector yelling out what they're seeing, right? You want them to be able to talk in a normal tone. Uh, today, that can be done um, by uh, using Bluetooth earbuds as a microphone, like using a Pixel Buds compared to the device. But we really want to get to where the de- you don't need uh, another device to do it. Now, the assistant one, Alan, I, wanna, I don't want to leave that one hanging. Yeah, you guys are totally right. How cool would it be to have Google Assistant right, integrated in, into the system? And, um, and that really is a little bit why we're giving this preview, not the assistant part, but the, the integration part. This is why we're, this preview of this EAP that we announced last week is kind of hinting to the optionality of having access to some of these other apps that, that are built into the phone. And there's a, there's a lot of people here really trying to be very conscious and considerate about how we can build that in where it's adding value. And, and frankly, that becomes the really hard part. So I can kind of give props to other people on the team and the product management team here uh, in AR we're all thinking about, you know, how we can add value, how it can, you know, be usable, and how can we have the device uh, interact in a way that respects the user and their privacy and also respects the bystander, right? Like, we, we also don't want someone to say, hey, just start recording, right? And it picks up everybody in a cafe or something. Like, it's, it's a hard problem to do right, and we're, we, uh, we're committed to doing that work to make it right. Well, I th- and I think the great part is that now that you've got this uh, this advanced tethering between the phone and uh, the device, that you can increasingly start taking advantage of the features that are on the phone itself. You know, so you can take advantage of the uh, the wearer detection. You know, is the voice that I'm hearing is the voice that just triggered this hot word? The person who is registered to this phone, or is it somebody walking by trying to uh, snipe them? Um, so you know increasingly you're going to be able to take advantage of those features. And I think that's going to be a good thing. Uh, Increasingly, you'll be able to take advantage of the voice transcription features that are on the phone without having to put all of these features into uh, the device that's on the glass itself. So you can offload some really complicated tasks to a device that has the dedicated chip to it. I kind of think of that in a way as um, you're taking advantage of the lessons that you've learned in cloud development offloading difficult tasks to the cloud and bringing them, you know, and, and, and still enabling local access to now doing the same thing on the phone where you can offload the difficult tasks onto the phone. And, and here we're seeing some old, old video. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it is old. That is the Google Glass, like the idea of it. Um, but these are the kind of interactions you know, with significant improvements that, you know, I was kind of alluding to that, that we're thinking through. Um, yeah. No, and, one, one of the greatest yeah. features used to be just easily sending those text messages. And, and as you said, easily communicating between, uh, between people in the same company. We're used to doing that sort of thing, you know, via text message or, you know, once upon a time we would use Nextel radios. Being mm-hmm. able to do that using Glass seems like a really, really exciting opportunity as the capabilities start getting on board. Yeah, I, I, so I agree with you, but I, I do want to couch a little bit of caution. And that is, we're not trying to replace the phone either, right? So it's a situational use case. We want to take these capabilities um, and that's what this early access and you'll see more next year and the year after where we'll be, this early access program will allow folks to see and and participate in exactly that kind of marrying of the solution where it makes sense to have on a, on a head mounted wearable on a glass, uh, where it makes sense to instead pull out your phone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one of the examples that I give, uh, that, you know, we're working on is like, well, we're, how do we do a better together? And I'll just kind of go back to the tasks one a little bit. The better together is, you know, 
for Google tasks to work, you have to accept the task or set it yourself, right? It's assigned by you today. And so, you know, we've got a, a developer ad kit. Let me give a shout out to Jan Kleiner. And she's made this demo where you can write an app and app sheet, send the tasks to, uh, to somebody's Gmail. They click accept and that goes into, into the tasks now as a task list that they have to do. So imagine it's the work you need uh, somebody to do that day. Or, you know, I always joke like in the future, maybe it's remembering what your shopping list is, right? Or whatever, you know. You, uh, and so the, you know, as we go across that data now is going to show up everywhere. So the connecting all these things together to say, well, it's best to use task. It's cloud-based. I'm going to access it through my Gmail and it's going to show up in somebody's uh, in their, in their glass because they're going to be wearing it to do the job and reference the, the steps they need to do. That's the kind of better together. So when we start looking at generic general purpose applications, I guess I'll just coin that phrase now, but like what are sending texts or getting notifications or, um, you know, a number of other, you know, I think, you know, accessing assistant and those things, getting them into a glass, the head mounted wearable space is, is really about, is it better there or would it just be better to pull out my phone? Right. And it, it it's situationally dependent. Well, um, and I think so. that's the, I think that's the important part is that it's situationally, situationally dependent and the user gets to determine exactly what's appropriate. Um, I used to talk about when, when sending text messages or getting messages in that I could glance at a message and say, okay, can I ignore it? Can I reply to it with one or two words? Or do I need to pull out my phone to, to, to really give a real message? Um, and I think that's the power of these kinds of devices is that it now puts you in control of the best way to do so and the software has already managed the, it's it's available wherever you need it in the best way for you to need it at that moment. Yes, yeah, spot on. And uh, I can't talk about what we're doing in that regard, but exactly. Like just well, get the right information in front of somebody so they can decide how they want to action on it. Yeah, that's an awesome, that's an awesome problem space. And, and I think, and I think and I'm going to bring it to developers, right? That's like, exactly where I was going to go. <laughs> you need to think about that. The glass is not a second screen. I really want to stress that. That's where people have gone really wrong building apps is that unless your app is only going to be for glass, then yeah, you build your UX for the glass uh, and your UIs. But if in our, as we think as the world's going to move to in this, in this, you know, wirelessly tethered solution, uh, using a phone is like what pieces of what's on the phone make sense to go in the glass. And that could be, you know, information, you know, to, to elicit an action. It could be a heads up or it could be, you know, bringing things over. So, yeah, I mean, as a developers, it's, that's a big mind shift, yep. not second screen, more about what's important at the moment. I think the other element that developers need to keep in mind and to think about as they're, they're starting to move in this direction is the fact that you want your data available everywhere. You know, so right now a lot of developers think of it in terms of, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be developing for mobile first. How do we then say, well, okay, yes, you can develop for mobile first, but also make sure that you've got it available on the desktop when that's more appropriate, or on an audio only device if that's more appropriate, or through a, a mixed media device like glass. Um, think about those things. How do you make sure that it is available in all of those places? and that you can work with it there and present that information in the most appropriate way for that medium. And I, I think we've got some developer questions. We've, we've got a couple of questions coming in. So- can't uh, connect, Let's see, can connect with my app, Android equals smartwatch. Um, so today, uh, I, I apologize if I mess up your name, Mike, um, is, uh, so not today. So smartwatches run Wear OS. Um, versus Android, and, but it is it is an, an area that we're exploring. And and I'll kind of, you know, I'm gonna take this moment to kind of ride also on that point. And also Alan, what you said is that we feel strongly like there's a lot of value in the ecosystem, right? There's a lot of apps that have APIs that you can access straight out of the box in Android. And you can, you know, having data silos doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, so, you know, if it makes more sense to 
output through, you know, a, an app that's already, you know, there and you can integrate to, that makes your app stickier. And it also allows that data to be used and, and you can consume data from these other apps. Uh, so on why does that matter? Well, it matters because there's data that's on smartwatches, uh, to Mike's point, that, yeah, we're looking at. Today, it's not. Today, it is Android. Um, and we're starting off with with Pixel, I, I will say, uh, in this early access program to call that out because uh, we do have some fun stuff on the language app where we are uh, tr trying to leverage the tensor chip for better accuracy and, and speed because that allows us to use some ML models that we're trying um, but we are really dedicated to the, the Android uh, ecosystem um, and, and showing the value of that. I think there's some more questions. I love ticking yeah, through questions. Mike had another good answers. question that I kind of want to leverage, uh, leverage off as well. Um, can I use API for Google Glass in my app? And I, I think that also might actually, um, one of the things that might be useful is to explain exactly what developing for Glass is, good, is like, because it's changed a lot since the initial days. Yes. So um, similar to, I mean, really before last week, uh, you would build a, an APK and that APK would be installed onto the, uh, the EE2 device and, or before. Um, with, uh, there, are, there are APIs that are specific to operating on the, on the device. Um, so moving forward, uh, we will can I, can, ju oh, yeah. just one just one quick thing. Now, if yeah. I remember correctly, the Play Store AP the Play Store library is not available on Glass. Is that correct? Or the Play that is library? Correct. Sorry. Yeah. So for GE two, we do not have GMS Core, which is the core set of APIs you need to connect to all things Play Store and Google. So um, the applications you, you know today are pushed through either an EMM system that a, a company may have. Or uh, we have a flash station uh, that you can flash onto the device. Yeah, I'd be pretty self-critical on it. It's suboptimal for like individual use, and we don't really like it. So moving forward, uh, one of the other huge benefits. Uh, and before I say moving forward, the other thing is if you don't have GMS Core, you don't have a Google ID. So somebody has to log into your app. You can't just take their ID from what they already have on their phone, right? Uh, so that's not super user friendly sometimes. Sometimes it's awesome for security, by the way. Sometimes it's not so user friendly. If someone's like, hey, these are the glasses I'm gonna use today. I want all my apps to be logged in at the same time, right? Know that it's me. So uh, with this with this new um, phone-based solution, we do have access to the Play Store. So you can push an app and have it be glass enabled. We do have access to your Google ID because with the new companion app that runs on, on, on the phone, you have to log into that companion app. And then any uh, applications that are written to be glass enabled, they are picked up by the companion app. And then the companion app manages all of the connectivity and, and transfer and everything to the glass. So you don't have to worry about coding to any of that. You don't have to, you know, figure out what's my transport protocol or any of that. We'll take care of all that for you. And we'll have an early access on, on how you can do that uh, sometime next year. Uh, hopefully it's going to be early next year. So it kind of goes to your question, Mike, on is there a Google API? We haven't publicly launched one at this point. We're kind of giving a preview, a, a kind of crawl, walk, run preview of where we're going. Uh, we're listening to, to users. We're listening to developers specifically, like, is this kind of split compute wirelessly tethered model? Is, is that a, a attractive? Is it a problem? We think it's super valuable and attractive, but we're also listening. So we want to hear, um, you know, how, if, if anybody sees a problem there and then, uh, but our, our direction is, yeah, we're going to re start reaching out to developers next year. We're going to show you how to do it. Uh, we'll have demos and we'll have your capability to start building apps and writing to these APIs. I've got to say, it's really exciting. The, the notion of this, this dual app capability is really exciting to me because it does mean that you can put um, that user logic, all of the, the user-based communication on the phone side of things and have it more of a um, presenting information to, to Glass or potentially in the future to some other device that may be using the same set of protocols. So that's really exciting to me. 
Yeah, um, and there's our developer site. Actually, great. that's cool. Um, whoever's running this in the background, that's awesome. Props to you, man. I, I, uh, I believe I believe we give Medusha credit for uh, for pulling yeah. stuff up for us. It was awesome. Uh, I think there's another question. I think that uh, Saba has. They've been waiting. And he, he's an OG Explorer user. He's after you, Alan. He's your his buddy. Yep. Uh, let's see. You tried na maps navigation. Yeah. And you almost crashed. Yeah, I totally believe you. Um, we, uh, I can't talk about what we're doing in, in now. It is the second most asked for enterprise feature from our customers. We take it really seriously and, uh, and I'm in the AR team. So, um, you know, we we want to make sure that nobody ever falls into a bottle again on their bike. Uh, and again, this kind of goes back to I really wish I could just say, look at all this amazing stuff that's coming out. And we could if we didn't really care about privacy and context and awareness and such, because that's the easy, easy parts right in the app. The hard part is making sure the app doesn't do something like stick you in a ditch. And um and so it, it is, how do you put just enough information to not be distracting, but to get you to where you want to be? Um, and, and we are taking it seriously. So I think we had a blog post uh, that Justin Payne did, I think, I want to say back in August or September, where we are doing public testing now. Um, and we're looking at experiences and we're really looking at bystanders, safety and awareness, user safety and awareness, privacy contextual awareness, uh, all of these things. And so that testing's going on and uh, we are, we'll continue. And, and at some point uh, we will have this big aha moment, but um, today it's really kind of baby steps. Unfortunately, I know we all want to be there. I want to be there. I want to have some amazing, you know, AR uh, solutions. So yeah, it's uh, we're working on it. Um, I, I, I think one of the interesting questions and kind of dilemmas that I always see is that there are certainly applications where AR makes a lot of sense and navigation is one of them. And there are applications where you still want a visual component, but you don't want the distraction that an AR overlay may cause. And I can, I can certainly see wrestling with that notion of, well, okay, right now it sits in the upper right-hand corner of my vision. Most of the time I don't see it, but sometimes I need to. You know, so I can I can very much see the the engineering team looking at that and saying, well, how do how do we meet these two completely opposite objectives? Yeah, and that's a that's a design challenge. You know, as a developer, that's a design challenge. You have to be you you, you, you we've learned that we really have to be thoughtful about what we put in people's field of vision. For one, it's not binocular, so. If I look at Magic Leap 2, I look at, um, you know, HoloLens 2 and some of these other devices that are more goggle features and, and they take over uh, both eyes. You know, that's a very purpose-built product that allows you to get this kind of 3D, you know, truly, you know, what people think in the movies like augmented, you know, views. Um, but that's not something you can kind of just walk around where, right, for lots of reasons. Uh, and so... When we get into a smaller form factor and a monocular form factor, we have to be really, you do have to be cognizant about what you can put into that UI. And um, so from there, uh, you, you kind of think more about what's glanceable. What would, if I glance up at it, what can I gather? What information can I need to then focus my attention back on the job? So I want to, I love the example that we have um, with one of our, our third party partners is that GE wind turbines has mechanics that go out, they wear glass and that they glance up and they're getting information about the unit on these wind turbines that they have to fix. And that saves them when they're up however many hundreds of feet on these massive wind turbines from having to pull out a tablet or a phone and it puts them at a safety risk and they can just glance up and they get the information they need. Yep. So bringing that more into field of view or bringing it more front and center uh, by putting more information in there is something to be really, uh, really aware of. Well, aware of, but also careful about, because you know, if you put too much now in the field of view, how much are you blocking what they're trying to work on? You know, yeah, exactly. GG is an example again. So it's, it's a really delicate balance. Um, 
which I can certainly appreciate. I mean, I've always loved the notion that it is glanceable, that it is up there. But, you know, the navigation example is a great one about why sometimes uh, you need it a little more in your field of vision. Kind of leveraging off that though, I have a, a follow-up question. Then we've got a great question coming in from Dan. Um, one of the criticisms of the, the previous glass was that it was sometimes difficult to hear, uh, you know, because it very much relied on this notion of the, the bone conducting speaker, which worked eh, okay sometimes. But again, it was trying to make sure you were aware of your audio surroundings, yet still available to hear those chirps and notifications when you needed to. What is the new hardware? Uh, how does the new hardware address that? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. And Dan, I promise I'll answer your question very detailed, actually, because um, <clears throat> it does matter to developers on that one. Uh, so, the, um, so the speaker is now an air speaker. Bone conduction didn't really work out. I mean, reality is we did lots of testing on it. Um, it's a super cool technology, uh, but just not the right technology for, for the wearable uh, from our, our studies. So we do have an open ear speaker. It's very, it's right behind the ear. So it doesn't need to actually be very loud um, for people to hear it. It also, because it's right behind the ear, people don't have to increase the volume very loud uh, to be able to hear. So you don't want to have a lot of bystander effect. Like nobody wants a bystander listening into your meet meeting if you're, yeah. if you don't want it to. Right. So uh, we've built that in and, um, and that's a direction we'll continue to, to move forward with. Uh, we're looking at some, we think that there's some interesting intersections between what you can show visually and what you can do audibly for people. And it's also one of the reasons that we leaned really heavily into adding fast pair earlier this year. So you can just pick up some pixel buds uh, and you can, you can connect them you know, to, the, to the glass and then you can have everything go in the ear if you need that uh, greater so you know, fidelity. So again, I, I guess that speaks to the notion of the fact that you know you've got devices that are doing very specific things, and you can get other devices that are doing specific things, and they'll all work together. So that's a I can very yeah. much see how that's I mean, you know, the direction to to head. Yeah, we didn't really want to put. I, I've seen some uh, other devices where they um, I don't remember what they are, but they like they had these little earbuds that you could pull out. They were attached to the device, and you could put them in. Look, I think Pixel Buds are pretty cool. There's plenty of other really cool Bluetooth headphones. We all own different ones. So there's no reason to make somebody have something different and try and compete there. They're all awesome. So why not just make it easy for people to add the devices they want? And yeah. BLE and Bluetooth make that super easy. That all right, sense. I want to get to Dan's question because there's more to it than is there an LED, if I may. So Dan, the answer is yes. There is a vis visible LED. It is green. It Let's is on the front. Trigger. Hang on. It's uh, super bright. And there it is. Uh, nope, no, you just turned nope, on that's, the device. That's... I can see. Yeah, you just turn on it. Go to the camera app. Yep, there we go. You can see it now. There you go. So the little green dot that's right there, it's on the front and outside. So bystanders can see it from a wide range of angle. And major learning from Google Glass, right? I mean, come on. So that is there. Now, here's the other major learning. This, this is what I'm going to share um, because it is applicable to developers is you cannot bypass it. So if you access the sensor, the camera, and soon the microphone, that light will come on. You have no chance to change it. It's not something that uh, we are going to allow developers to make an option. Uh, we think that's the right move. And, and I'm pretty, you can tell, I'm pretty adamant about it, right? So um, it was a big problem for us in, in, the, uh, uh, in the past. So, uh, and it was huge feedback from the market, right? Uh, so we have that. Um, and it's going to be for any sensors that could be picking up, you know, uh, users around, which is really the microphone and, and the camera. Uh, that'll be built into the actual operating system firmware. It is today, sorry for the camera, and we'll be adding Mike here shortly uh, with a firmware update in the not too distant future. No, having the tally light was always one of the big, uh, big criticisms. But even you know, just the fact that uh, the LED itself is very, very bright and very visible to outsiders is a, is a good indicator. But the green lights really kind of drives home the point that yes, other people will know 
when these sensors are active, when there's a privacy concern that may be going on around you. So it's yeah. great to see that. Yeah, and actually one more point on that, and then uh, Saba, I'll get to your AR question, uh, is, um, I think that's the next question. Uh, but the, the point on the LED is when you're banking an application, you have to think, and it's a head mounted wearable, and it might be used in an environment where there are bystanders, like you have to design as much for the bystander awareness and comfort, and I mean mental comfort, right, um, as well as the user. It's really easy to focus on, I want to do this for the user. But if you have something that have these sensors, you really got to think about, well, if I have a construction worker, they're wearing glass, they're going out on a site and they need to do a walkthrough and take photos and they're just going to use the glass because it's easier than doing it with their with their phone. Um, you, you want people around them to know I'm taking a photo, right? I'm using this camera and just to make it really clear. And what we found is that when glass is used as a tool for someone to do their job, there really has not been a lot of negative pushback. People are like, okay, cool. You're using that to do a job and I get it. Where we get this mental discomfort and we're really considered around is when people don't know why you're using a lot, right? So if I'm walking down the street, and which is not really the right use case, but say I'm at a construction site again, and I'm walking around the construction site wearing this, and those people, the other construction workers have no idea what's going on, like why is Stefan wearing this thing? Some of them will be curious, some of them don't care, and some of them may say, anyway, I'm not comfortable with that. And, um, and so, having good training on site, making sure people know that the glass is going to be used totally addresses all that mental comfort. And we've got a great partner in Augmetics who uses glass with some of their doctors to do transcription services. And they put it, they put up signs in the waiting room to say, you have the option if you don't want your doctor to wear glass, but they will be wearing glasses, the glass device, uh, as part of their day, day in, day out um, work. And the funny thing is they learned if you told people it was going to happen, then they weren't, they didn't have a problem when they, they got in with the doctor. And that's, right. what, that's what, the bystander awareness. One of the things that I think I found my experience in wearing glass and still wearing glass is that people are, are usually pretty fine with it. When you explain, no, I'm not recording constantly. Yes. You'll have a pretty good idea when I am, you know, no, there's no major, you know, major privacy issues beyond what we already have with our phones. And yes, I understand the privacy issues. People are very receptive to the notion. Um, I tested these out at a recent conference. And when I, I told somebody that I was doing a recording, their first reaction was very concerned. What are you recording? What do you mean you're recording? How do I know you're recording? And once they saw it, literally 30 seconds later, um, their entire attitude changed. They were very excited about the fact that I was wearing a camera that was recording everything that was going on around me. And just, just the knowledge and understanding of what's really going on really goes a long way to helping people um, work with the privacy concerns that are there. So now we've got, uh, we've got a video of, from Augmetics up on the screen talking a little bit about how, <laughs> how they're using glass. Yeah, that's our, that's our old white version too. That's, that's neat to see in a video. Um, yeah, so that's exactly it. They, they have a solution where uh, instead of the doctor having to go do these notes and not pay attention to the, to the patient, they just pay attention to the patient, the Augmentics application running on glass. Uh, it allows them to get notes and knows what happened in that. Um, awesome partners. They're one of our original partners as well. So uh, shout out to them on that. Um, and again, I so think it, it we of, have this AR question too, Alan. Okay. Sorry, I just want to. I don't. I, yep. I, I want to get to the the AR maintenance question. And um, so the uh, yeah, I think it came from yeah uh, Saba originally or, or whoever. But the question is like, when are we going to get true AR? All right. So true AR requires a binocular based solution. Your eyes both have to be looking through the same plane of glass. That's why AR on a phone works great. Both eyes look at the phone and the phone does the looking for you. In a head mounted, we have to have a binocular based solution or you have a semi AR, I'll call it. Uh, it's not, you know, kind of based model where one eye is doing it. And if you do that with a dominant eye, then it kind of looks like it's, it's AR. Um, 
those that, that's those are things that uh, today are really kind of focused on the phone or you have to have this big goggle based solution. Now that's it. What can you do with a monocular based solution? With a monocular based solution, you can start tricking, not tricking, but you can get a semi AR uh, solution where the eye sees those dots, you can kind of point them out. And we have some partners with the, uh, on TeamViewer and some others with apps where you can do like laser pointers, you can draw um, you know, tags in the, in the, uh, you know, in the camera, what the camera is showing them from somebody that's sitting at their desk and such, um, for true overlay. Like, I think I've seen a demo where someone like starts picking apart a, an engine in a car or something like that. Um, those are hard because you have to do real world anchoring. And I know the AR core team has just put out a bunch of awesome tech around doing like world locking and, uh, and a number of other, you know, you know, degree of freedom solution, um, you know, APIs. And those have to make their way in, into head-mounted wearable kind of space. It's uh, without the goggles and only having a monocular-based solution, I'll just make the forecast. Those are probably two to three to four years away of true adoption. They take a ton of power. So anything that is going to run on is going to have to be tethered to a battery. Uh, so now you have a cord. We'd like to get it to where you don't need a cord because uh, that's uncomfortable sometimes uh, for some use cases. You know, it's also in certain work environments, it's a safety hazard. That cord can get caught on things, right? You can go back to somebody working in a factory or, you know, go back to the construction site or imagine you're jumping out of an ambulance because you just arrived on site. You don't want a cord hanging around. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got a ways to go to get there. Uh, but there's some things we can definitely do on the phone today. And I would say you can pick up things on the phone and decide once we get these APIs out to you guys next year is you'll be able to stream that view to the phone uh, and pick up from the camera on the phone. So we are figuring out how we can do some, some AR like solutions, but the true overlay uh, I'm skeptical until we get the lightweight uh, binocular based solutions guys. And, and I'll be honest, again, you know, one of the things I, I really like to think about is how much do we really need those kinds of full overlays? Um, there are certainly applications where we do, no doubt about it. But I, I guess kind of as a designer, as a developer, I worry that we start overlaying too much stuff and we're now missing out on what we're, we're actually trying to work on. You know, so it's great to say, yeah, we're going to overlay um, a diagram of the engine that we're working on with lots of arrows pointing to the various things. But unless we as designers are careful about that, we're now obscuring lots of the other stuff that the person working on the engine needs to know, needs to see in order to do their job correctly. You know, the, the guy who's scaling the, uh, the, the GE tower to, to get up to the wind turbines needs to be very, very situationally aware and not just focused on what's in front of them. So we need to be careful about that. I love, I love full vision AR. I love full overlay AR. I think it's cool. I think there's a lot of practical uses, um, but I think we need to be careful before we dive in too quickly to it. Couldn't agree more. And, uh, and I actually want to pick up on uh... Uh, I think it was a, a statement about the Army testing all HoloLens. I, I think what the HoloLens team did was amazing. I mean, the all of the, you know, the you know soldier of the future kind of activities seem super cool. Like if I'm a technologist, I'm a product manager and designer, like I look at that and you're like, that is pretty awesome stuff. But when you get feedback that it wasn't ideal for them to, you know, to work on their mission or there was user comfort items, we also have to take those super into consideration. Uh, and those are, you know, massively important. And I think um, just building on what Alan said is that there's a lot of very future facing and, and important work being done in this space. And like any other, you know, I would say nascent and, uh, you know, leading edge technical space, there's a lot of lessons that are gonna be learned here about what's useful, what's effective, and what's, what's going to matter. But it all starts with the person. You're sticking something on somebody's head in their face. It's got to be useful. It's got to be comfortable. And it's got to help them, you know, get the job or complete the mission. And yeah, I mean, um, 
Gla glass is glass is probably the most personal type device that we've ever uh, talked about. You know, we talk about our phones being more personal than our computers because they're always with us. Uh, we talked about our watches being more personal because you know they were closer to us and, and more accessible all the time. Glass is on your head. It's you know there there it can get more personal than that, but it's awfully awfully personal for the uh, the technology that we have today. And we need to be very, very cognizant of that. You know, in, in the software they that we develop, uh, in what's used and what's not used. What what software are we not going to allow as part of as part of Glass? Because it's either too personal or too distracting. Um, yeah. So I know we only have a couple of minutes here. So Alan, any uh, any last questions or thoughts or for the listeners? Uh, I, what can we do? So I, I think my biggest last question for you is going to be, um, you know, what what's the thing that you are most excited about that's coming next that you can talk about? What's what are you most uh, excited to see for developers to do, for your team to do, for the industry to do? Oh man, I have so many answers. <laughs> and I'm not most excited right about <laughs> any one thing, but. Um, you know what I what I can't wait to see. That's that's I think a way I'll approach this. What I can't wait to see people do is help people be more effective in their daily life. Okay, like I can't wait to see the things that once we get the APIs out here, they get split compute uh, and this wirelessly tethering platform available for y'all. I can't wait to see how you make my life better. Right? How do you? I mean. Not as a you know as a consumer maybe in the years down, but you know as, as a worker, like what can we do to make people's lives and their work lives better, easier, safer, more enjoyable? That's what I, I'm excited about, and I think that we're getting to a point where phones are powerful enough. There are head-mounted devices that you know coming out. I think glass, you know, is super, was significantly ahead of its time. We're going to continue to plan to push to be ahead of our time, both with software and hardware, uh, to give you all a platform where you choose, hey, I'm going to build on Google's ecosystem. I think these guys are doing cool things, and they enable me as a developer to, to bring out neat things. So I, I'm just stoked and excited to see what, what comes about in the next, I think the next three to four years are going to be a pretty amazing place in this space. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and I appreciate that response because that's, you know, as, as people who are watching this know, that's very similar to the responses that I usually give is that technology is great. Technology is fun. Technology is cool. But at the end of the day, it really has to be what is the technology doing for me? And uh, I think glass was always something that I felt is very personal. It was doing something for me. So I'm really excited to see where the, the team is building those sorts of things. The APIs are going to be available, and I'm really excited to, to start developing with the new APIs for Glass. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks very much for sharing all of that with us. And uh, I look forward to us talking many more times in the future. Yeah, I, I thanks for having me. Um, you know, if anybody, you know, feel free to, to hit me up on LinkedIn uh, or, you know, talk to our developer community here at, at Google. And Alan, thanks a lot, man. It's, I really appreciated the time and and getting to have a chat with you today. And thank, thank you, you to everybody who's listening in your questions. Really nice. And uh, thanks for being a supporter of Glass. Oh, that's that's amazing. Um, thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Alan. Very engaging conversation. We did have a lot of engagement in the chat. Some really very deep questions. And thanks, Stefan, for just you know going out of your way to just make sure that all those questions got um, attended to. Well, for Everyone who managed to join today, uh, thank you for joining Between the Brackets. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode. A um, few things, we just kindly request that you fill out the feedback survey that sort of pops up on the link or on the chat screen that gets appears wherever you're watching, whether you're on YouTube or on LinkedIn. We really, really want to hear from you. We want to know how we can improve upon the show. Um, if you aren't subscribed to our YouTube channel or you're not connected to us on LinkedIn, please do so. Um, we want you to be able to share feedback with us and we will send up a follow-up email. Um, you can also use 
the hashtag between the brackets to share how the show was and then follow us on the Google Devs North America handle. We're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. So we'll be having our next episode next month. Um, we'll be giving you more information. This is why you should sign up and subscribe to our channels uh, and on, also on our website. Um, if you have any questions like our earlier shared, please email us. Our email is btb-team at google.com. We're looking forward to seeing you next month. Till then, take care and stay safe.